Okay, guys, let's finish up this unit six and finish up our last science lesson before Christmas break. And so this is lesson four in your science book in unit six, starting on page 313. Please turn there. And our question we're talking today is, how does energy move through ecosystems? So we've gone all the way back and talked about ecosystems being all the living and non-living things in an area and how they interact. We've looked at different types of ecosystems, the roles that animals play or then their niche in the ecosystem. Some are producers, which are plants. Some are uh, herbivores, which eat only producers. They only eat plants. Some are omnivores. They eat plants and animals. Some are carnivores. They eat only animals. And so we've got all these animals that are predator and prey. We've got animals competing for food in the same ecosystem. So we've talked about a lot these last three lessons and the energy movement. Remember, all animals need energy and they get their energy from what did we read on Friday? They get their energy from food. If you don't eat, you don't get any energy. You're not going to have any energy to do anything. That's why it's important for you to eat. Eat your breakfast, eat your lunch, eat food. It gives you your body energy and the nutrients it needs to have energy. Okay. So how does that energy move through an ecosystem is today's lesson. And one way is the food chain. We've talked a little bit a lot about this when we were reviewing the benchmark. It starts with producers and then it goes to consumers, then decomposers. The food chain never stops. Here's a tundra food chain. The tundra is the coldest, driest ecosystem on Earth. Short summers mean little plant life grows here. Many animals either migrate or hibernate during the long, long cold winter. So they don't have a whole lot of producers. They don't have plants, a whole lot of plants. But here's one kind of plant. Reindeer moss uses energy from the sun to make and store sugars. Producers such as reindeer moss form the base of the tundra food chain. Remember mosses, remember from our last test we took last week, do you remember what kind of plant that is? A non-vascular plant? It doesn't have any leaves, does it? So this starts with a producer. It makes its own food. It makes sugars. Then who eats that? The caribou or reindeer are the first level consumers. The herbivores eat reindeer moss and other producers to get energy for their life functions. So you've got a producer and then you've got an herbivore like a caribou who eats the plant. But then you've got something who's going to eat the caribou, and that's a wolf. It's a second level consumer. They're predators. Animals such as caribou are their prey. So if you just imagine that arrow flowing into that next animal's mouth, <laughs> this is going into its mouth. It's is going into its mouth. Let's see what's on the next page here. And then scavengers, such as the Arctic gull, feed on the dead bodies of caribou, wolves, and other animals. Fungi and bacteria do the final cleanup work as they decompose the final remains of tundra organisms. The transfer of food energy from one organism to the next in an ecological community is called a food chain. Almost every food chain begins when producers capture energy from the sun. Without the sun, you don't have any plants because plants need sunlight for photosynthesis. So if we didn't have sunlight, it's bad news for everybody. Through photosynthesis, Producers convert this light energy into chemical energy and sugars, which they use for food. Food not used in the life process is stored in the tissues of the producers and then passed on to herbivores that eat the producer. Herbivores are first level consumers. Next in the food chain are the carnivores and omnivores, the second level consumers. Second level consumers eat herbivores and receive the food energy stored in their bodies. Third level consumers eat second level consumers. Scavengers may be second or third level consumers as they eat organisms that have died. When we say levels, it's just the next place on the food chain, okay? Don't let that confuse you. Decomposers are the final link in any food chain. They get energy as they break down the remains of the dead plants and animals and return the nutrients to the soil. Food webs. Like a spider web held together by many connecting threads, the path in a food web shows the feeding relationships among species in a community. You know, we talked about one day about both the frog and the little bird. They were both eating insects. And so uh, they're both competing for the food. So in that eco ecosystem, it's not just grass, insect, frog. It's grass, insect, frog, bird, and lots of other things. So that makes a food web when there's more than one straight line of energy. 
You don't just eat one kind of food and neither do organisms and food chains. Each consumer has a variety of choices when it comes to its next meal. A food web shows how food chains overlap. In other words, it shows what eats what. Look at the forest food web on the next page. We'll look at it in just a second. Both the mouse and the insect eat parts of the pine tree or its seeds. A snake can eat a mouse or a salamander. All of these living things eventually become food for decomposers. Decomposers return nutrients to soil. These nutrients in turn are used by producers to make food. And we'll take a, look, a closer look at this in a minute on the next page. Arrows in the web point in the direction that the energy is moving. Find the acorns in the mouse. Which way does the arrow point? It points from the acorn to the mouse. Energy moves from the producer to the consumer. Remember, I like to think about it. The arrow tells you what mouth it's going into. The acorns are going to the mouse's mouth. Energy moves from the producer to the consumer when the mouse eats the acorn. Predators limit the number of animals below them in a food web. If snakes were removed from the forest food web, the number of mice would increase. More mice means that more plants would be eaten. Eventually, the mice might run out of food and begin to die off. This would affect the hawks and other living things that eat the mice. All of the organisms in a food web are interdependent. It means they rely on, they de depend on each other to survive. <coughs> so here's a food web we we're looking at. And it starts with producers, okay? It has to start with a producer like acorns, okay? Um, and Or a pine tree. So here's two producers. They're plants. Acorns are eaten by the mouse. Then the mouse is eaten by two things. The mouse is eaten by a corn snake and the hawk. Also, the corn snake is eaten by a hawk. So look at this food. Well, we could start with acorns. It would go acorns. Food chain would go acorns, mouse, snake, hawk. But this is a bunch of food chains put together. If we look over here, we've got, we can go acorn. I can't see that thing keeps coming up. We can go this way. We can go pine tree, pine borer, pine borer insect, bird, kinglet hawk, or kinglet corn snake hawk, <laughs> or we can go pine tree, pine borer insect, salamander, corn snake, red-tailed hawk. So you see all these different food, food chains we can follow in this food web. Then once something is eaten, the fungi breaks it all down decomposes it at the top. It takes a lot of grass to support a hawk at the top of a food chain. Although hawks don't eat grass, the energy, energy they use comes from grass at the bottom. An energy pyramid shows how much energy passes from one organism to another up a food chain. And the organism in a layer of a pyramid feeds on those in the lower la level layer. Because it takes many producers to support smaller number of consumers, Producers in the bottom layer are the most numerous group. So there's a lot more plants than anything else. If you looked out your window right now, you see a whole lot of green plants, less now than in the spring, but you see grass, you see trees, you, you see other plants outside. You might see a bird here or there, maybe a squirrel, but you see a lot more plants than animals, don't you? Because there has to be a whole lot of producers to feed all the upper layers in an ecosystem. The third level consumers, like the leopard seal right here, a predator at the top of this energy pyramid, have the least amount of energy available to them. That's why their population is small. There's a lot less uh, top level consumers, predators, than there are other animals because it has, there's a lot fewer of them because it takes a lot of energy to feed them. Second level consumers, like octopus and salmon, feed on first level consumers below them in the pyramid. Because less energy is available to them, they are fewer. Krill, clams, and herring are first-level consumers. They consume phytoplankton. Some first-level consumers eat millions of tiny phyto phytoplankton every day. Then producers called phytoplankton are the base of this ocean energy pyramid. It all starts at the bottom with producers, and the energy passes to the next level, and then the next, and then the next. And the animals at the top, there's fewer of them than there are at the bottom takes all of this energy from the bottom level to be able to feed the top level, though. Environmental changes can affect energy flow in an energy pyramid. Suppose the number of salmon is reduced because of overfishing. 
Seals that eat the salmon may go hungry. They may even starve. Without salmon to eat them, the krill population would increase at a rapid rate. Such a large number of krill could then eat up all its food source as well as that of other species. One change in the flow of energy through an ecosystem affects every species in the ecosystem. Whatever happens at one level affects the energy level available at the rest of the pyramid. Okay, so some words you'll need to know today are food webs, food chains, energy pyramids, and a few things about them. Make sure you know these words for your quiz today. Get it done. And you are done with science until after Christmas break. Great job.